Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. And, and again, thank you for joining me as we uh, take this journey to the cross and very carefully and painstakingly go through that last week of Jesus' ministry in which, of course, he's crucified and rises from the dead. We've come today to Tuesday night, and that's what I want to talk about because I want you to imagine the emotional turmoil and the exhaustion that Jesus' disciples are feeling after the events on Tuesday. You know, Monday, of course, um, he had overturned the tables of the money changers, and on the previous day before that, that was on Sunday, he had ridden into the, into the city with the cries of Hosanna to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But then Tuesday came, and Tuesday was a day of controversy. Um, Jesus not only stood up against all of the, you know, of the chief priests and the Pharisees and all these individuals who were attempting to trip him up in his words, uh, he withstood that blast that came from them, and he had more than just withstood it. I mean, he had, you know, he had been exemplary in his dealings with them and uh, had left people quite overwhelmed. And yet, you know, when they were leaving, and Jesus looks at his disciples and he tells them it's time for them to go, and they leave Jerusalem again. They're going back to Bethany where he's staying. I've said it's three kilometers away. So he would have gone out of the city on Tuesday afternoon towards evening, gone down the steep embankment, which we have said at the bottom is the Kidron Valley, then going up the embankment on the other side, which is the Mount of Olives. He stands there at the top of the Mount of Olives and they turn back and they look towards Jerusalem. Matthew, who records this, simply says, Jesus left the temple and was going away. Now, a great many Bible teachers will point out that when Jesus left the temple on Tuesday, he never went back to the temple again. This was his last departure from the temple. Now, what's fascinating about this is that a lot of Bible teachers think that there is a correlation here between Jesus leaving the temple and the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel pictures the glory of God leaving the temple. That is the first temple. And when the glory of God left the first temple, the Babylonians came and utterly destroyed that temple. And so we get, you know, it, it's a parallel account. This seems eerily similar to what happened before. Jesus, the glory of God, leaving the temple. And now from the vantage point of overlooking the temple, the disciples still haven't figured it out. And some of them turn around and say, look, Master, what marvelous stones make up that temple. And of course, um, you know, Jesus tells them that not one stone is going to be left on another. They're all going to be torn down. Now, according to the biblical account, the first temple, uh, the one that had been built by Solomon, was destroyed by the Babylonians and they burned it to the ground. And that left Israel in exile for 70 years. And then Israel returned to the promised land. And then in the year 536 BC, the foundation was laid to the second temple and it was dedicated at the exact spot where the first temple had once stood, the one that Solomon built. You know, in time, that second temple, which was so much smaller than the first one, uh, when Herod the Great became king of Israel, and, uh, you know, that's the Herod the Great that had, you know, put all the boys in Bethlehem to death. That's the Herod the Great that was known for his amazing cruelty even killing his own sons and his own wife. I mean, this is, this is a man who had no concern for human life, but he wanted to ingratiate himself to the Jews, so he took that smaller second temple and he enlarged it, beautified it. Well, you know, a lot of scholars will tell you it, it was, there was nothing of the old temple left standing. In fact, the one that he had built was just massive and it was larger than anyone had, had ever seen. And um, this is the temple that they were still building on. In the time of Jesus, it had not yet been completed, and it still hadn't been completed by the time the Romans burned it to the ground. So I'm giving you a picture here. Uh, Jesus having the controversy on Tuesday in the temple when the uh, religious leaders of Israel and the ones that ran the temple uh, were trying to, you know, take Jesus down and were trying to, you know, build a division between Jesus and his followers. They wanted to make him look foolish. They asked him all manner of questions to try to trip him up. Um, they clearly hate the Son of God. 
That's the temple leadership. So Jesus is now leaving, and the glory of God is leaving. And as they stand on the top of the Mount of Olives looking back at the temple, Jesus has just told his disciples not one stone will be left on another. Now, you've got to believe their minds are reeling at this point in time. I mean, what can they possibly say to this? And finally, they they do speak and they say, when will this happen? And then they ask, and what will be the sign of the end of the age and of your coming? That is, in their minds, if the temple is going to be destroyed, that must mean that Israel is going to be destroyed. And if Israel is going to be defeated, that must mean that we are at the close of the end of this age and that Jesus will come to sit on his glorious throne and then he will rule over all things. He will destroy all of Israel's enemies. So in their own minds, these events have to coincide with each other. Now, please don't be too dismissive of them. I, I do know that you know less than 40 years later, the temple would be destroyed by the Romans and now there's been no temple standing there on that ground for you know, it's getting close to 2,000 years. And so we, you know, we look at that and say, wow, they sure got that wrong. But, but please don't think they got everything wrong. I mean, they do know that there is something about Israel's role in the future. And so they're asking Jesus, tell us when will the temple be destroyed? Tell us when Israel is going to be defeated. Tell us when the end of the age is going to happen, because in our minds, those things are connected. And then Jesus gives a very important statement. His statement to them says, see that no one leads you astray. Now, uh, that's an interesting thing because Jesus knows that when he is gone, there are going to be all manner of false prophecies that will be running around about when the end of the age is coming and and also when will be the sign of, of Jesus coming. So these things will be, rumors will be flying everywhere. And he's saying, it's so important that you are not led astray. So don't overreact. And then he tells them, I'm going to tell you a number of things that are going to be happening, but they're all the beginnings of birth pangs, he says. Now, I I find all of that very interesting because when I think about birth pangs, I think about the birth of my first child, our daughter, Rachel. I was 25. uh, My wife was 24. Kathy was 24. And um, uh, it was still some time before uh, she was going to be born. But the two of us had decided that we would go to a, for a walk. We lived in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan at the time. I was a university student. And uh, we were walking uh, next to the, the uh, South Saskatchewan River, which flows right through the center of town. It's actually quite lovely there. And we were some distance away from where we had parked the car. So we'd gone for quite a walk. And suddenly, Kathy says, I'm having contractions. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, oh no, our baby is about to be born right here next to the South Saskatchewan River, far away from the hospital because the car's too far away. I won't even be able to get her back to there. But what I didn't know yet is something called Braxton Hicks contractions. They're basically, you know, the womb of the woman getting ready for that final deliverance those contractions don't mean that the birth is about to happen, but they do tell us that the birth will soon happen. You see, that's the distinction that we're making. And that's what Jesus says. I'm going to mention now seven labor pains or seven signs of the earth convulsing as we wait for the end. And so let me give you the seven that Jesus gives. The first sign that he gives to them is uh, as they're standing there looking at the temple, he says, many false messiahs, false Christs will come and lead many astray, false saviors. There will be all manner of people who will claim to be the savior of the human race and that they will save humanity from all their troubles. One after another after another will come. Some of them will look like the Antichrist. And Jesus says, but the end is not yet. This is determined to come, and it will continue to happen. Then he mentions a second labor pain, and he says, nation will rise against nation. In other words, he says, wars are going to continue for a long time now, and they're just going to simply go on. Then he mentions a third labor pain, famines and earthquakes. Um, That doesn't mean that there are going to be an intensification of famines and earthquakes, but rather famines and the troubling of the earth will just carry on. The fourth labor pain, persecution, he says, against believers. And Jesus makes it very plain that many people are going to falsely put my followers to death. And we know that was especially true 
in the first century and in the next several centuries after that, as a great many believers were both imprisoned and put to death for their faith. Uh, We know that Stephen in Acts chapter 6 was the first martyr. Acts 12 records the martyrdom of James, who is the first one of our Lord's apostles that was put to death. And then history also records that Paul uh, was beheaded, uh, Peter was crucified, and that all of the apostles of our Lord were all martyred except the apostle John, uh, who you know, was put into exile for a great period of time. You know, today, in our day, the death toll against two believers just keeps going on. Christians are being persecuted in places like North Korea, Somalia, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Sudan, Iran, Pakistan, Eritrea, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Yemen, the list goes on and on where Christians are called upon to pay the ultimate price for their faith. In other words, the only thing that's stopping them from being killed or put into prison, all they have to do is renounce their faith, but they refuse to do it. Jesus said that would be a labor pain, a sign of his coming. Then the fifth labor pain that he mentions is that false prophets will arise. And then the sixth, he mentions apostasy, or that many people will fall away from the true gospel. That is, there will be a counterfeit gospel, and people will simply fall away from Christ. But in the midst of all of those ominous signs that are going to just carry on happening, Jesus mentions one more sign, and this one's positive. The last one, he says, is that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then, he says, the end will come. Now, you know, there's so many uh, different Bible teachers that have wondered exactly how will we recognize that seventh sign? When is it that the entire earth has been so saturated with the good news of the gospel so that, you know, everyone has had a chance to hear? It's very difficult to answer that question. It's also been pointed out that when Jesus said that the gospel would be preached to all nations, the idea of a nation state the way that we have it today, well, that simply didn't exist in that day. Um, What Jesus actually said is that the gospel would be preached to all ethne. And that is, you know, we get the word ethnic group from that. And it may be that Jesus simply said that all people groups, all tribes, races, tongues, languages, you know, all people groups will have had access to the gospel. The gospel will have permeated the entire earth. And when that happens, he says, the end will come. Well, you know, um, are we there now? And that's the question that a lot of people are asking. And I don't know how to answer the question. I simply don't know the answer. I know that the church began in the city of Jerusalem. I know it moved from there uh, into Judea, which is the surrounding Jewish countryside around Jerusalem among Jews. Then the gospel permeated into Samaria, a place that was made up of people who were half Jewish and half Gentile. From there, it began to permeate into the Middle East Uh, into what was called Asia, around Turkey, uh, up into uh, Syria, places like that. Then it went into Europe, into the heart of the Roman Empire. We know that Thomas, one of the twelve, carried the gospel into India. And uh, we know that eventually the gospel came to North America, South America, and all sorts of unlikely places on the earth. I mean, today, when I think about, you know, where it is that the gospel has been rapidly growing, places like China, places like northern India, all sorts of places like that where we would never have expected such a rapid growth of the gospel. It does tell me that the sign, this final sign that Jesus gave us that would happen right before the end of the age is that, you know, we are drawing close to that. How close? I don't know. But I do know that we're drawing ever closer to the second coming of Jesus. And that's what Jesus was saying. Yes, this temple is going to be destroyed, and then don't get your knickers in a knot. The end of the age is not going to happen right away. Lots of birth pangs will be occurring, one after the other, and they will repeatedly happen all the way to the end of the age. You just be faithful. And then Jesus gives one more, and I call this one a sharp pain. It's, you know, we've been talking about birth pangs, but then comes this one very sharp pain that gets everybody's attention. And this one is when he says, and when you see 
the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be. And then Matthew, who records these words of Jesus, says, and he puts these little, this parenthesis right in the text. He says, let the reader understand. So he's asking those of us who read these words to set, step back and say, okay, what did Jesus mean when he says, and when the abomination that causes desolation happens? Well, I think what Jesus is doing, he's quoting to us from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament where those words are found. And so I'm reading now Matthew 24, uh, 15 to 21. Jesus says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not take uh, or happen in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no one never shall be. Now, this, this phrase again, the abomination that caused desolation, as I've said, comes from the book of Daniel. It's found in Daniel chapter 9 and in chapter 11. If you don't know the book of Daniel, there are sections of that book which are prophetic. That is, Daniel in his own time period, a man living in Babylon after the, uh, the first destruction of the temple, uh, is looking into the future and he is seeing things that will yet come to place. Now, what's fascinating about the book of Daniel is what Daniel saw in the future, we now, on this side of history, we actually see those events in the past. And here's what Daniel actually predicted. Daniel gave a reference to the abomination that causes desolation, and that was fulfilled in the year 167 BC. What happened in 167? Well, what happened is a Syrian commander by the name of Antiochus defeated the people of Israel, came into Jerusalem, and because of his profound hatred of the Jews and of their religion, decided he would desecrate their temple. He brought a statue of the Greek god Zeus, and he brought it into the temple of, of Jerusalem, and uh, he put it into the Holy of Holies. And then what he did beyond that is he brought pigs and sacrifice them on the Jewish altar to make it unclean. And then he made a decree that any practice of Judaism would be punishable by death. They say that Antiochus filled the countryside uh, with crosses where he nailed anyone who uh, decided to practice their own Jewish faith. Now, Jesus is borrowing that image. And by the way, if you want to know about that event, the Jews still think about that today. When we're, you know, Christian people are celebrating Christmas, the Jewish people are celebrating Hanukkah. And this is the time when, you know, a Jewish resistance fighters rose up and drove the Syrians out. It's the, the battle of light against darkness. That's what Hanukkah means for the Jews today. But going back to the teaching of Jesus, Jesus knew these events had happened. And he was predicting that another such event is about to happen, and indeed his words were fulfilled in the year AD 70. So not only is the temple desecrated in 167 BC, but in AD 70, the Romans come into the temple. And Jesus calls this time when the Romans destroy Jerusalem and the temple, the most monstrous and savage attack on a people in human history. You know, the devastation that happened in Jerusalem as the Romans came in and started slaughtering the people of Israel, um, just simply wantonly killing civilian. But that devastation stretched beyond Jerusalem, and Jews literally fled to the mountains and hid in the caves, even as Jesus had said. But the Romans were brutally killing uh, all, and they had no mercy, and anyone who had time to get away had no time to go home and to collect his belongings. So it turns out that it's just as Jesus had said, and Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, says that that time was a time of unprecedented suffering. He tells of savagery, wanton slaughter, followed by disease, in which 
There was hunger and famine that came so that mothers would even eat their own children to survive the siege that the Romans laid on Jerusalem. Yeah, there had never, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of times when there have been greater deaths in history, but there had never been a time of such a high percentage of deaths in one city than this time. So Jesus, in fact, his words literally came true. Now, as a side note then, you know, most Christians at that time, you know, remembering this prophecy, Actually, when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem in AD 68, actually fled from the city, believing that Jesus' words were about to be fulfilled, and they actually saved their own lives. So here's the question that we're asking. Now, Jesus talked about events that were fulfilled in AD 70, and remember, he's having a discussion with his disciples, and they're talking about the end of the age, and about birth pangs, and how do we know how close we are to the end, and you know, when does the end of the age happen, and when do you come back, and you know, and when do you sit on your glorious throne, and rule over the whole world, and, and end the reign of evil, like, how close are we to that? And then Jesus tells them this, you know, protracted long story about something that's going to happen less than 40 years in the future, and as I've said, uh, we've gotten a long time beyond that. So clearly that event did not signal the time of the end. So what does Jesus tell us these things for? And I think there are two reasons. The first reason is he tells us what's going to happen to the temple because he wants us to know that there is in fact a prophetic calendar that leads us to the end of the age. He wants us to know that when he tells us there'll be wars and rumors of wars and the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come, he's not just a false prophet making that up. And so in order to demonstrate that he knows exactly what's going to happen and in fact that he's directing all things, he tells about the destruction of Jerusalem so that we know that he is in control of history. But there's something else that happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was destroyed, obviously uh, Christianity could no longer function in a destroyed city. It was, it was gone. And it forced the Christian gospel into the rest of the world. It forced the Christian gospel to become the global phenomenon that it is today. See, it's so important to say this. Had these events not happened this way, the, the Christian message would have stayed rather close to its center point. Jerusalem itself, but instead it was forced outward. Now, Jesus also used the, t the words great distress, and then he takes us from there to the end of the age. He says, when we get from the destruction of Jerusalem, I mean, you know, think about the, the three events we've been talking about, 167 BC, when the temple was desecrated, um, AD 70, or when the temple was burned and destroyed. Now Jesus takes us to the end of the age, and he talks about a great distress that will happen before the end comes. During that time, he says, the sun is going to be darkened. The moon will not give off its light. The stars will fall from the heavens. Great celestial signs will mark the final troubling of the earth. And when it seems like no one can survive, when it seems like the earth is destined to become a ruin and everyone will perish. At that time, says Jesus, then the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. It's then that he will send the angels at the trumpet call of God and he's gonna gather his elect from the four corners of the earth from one end uh, of heaven to another. So you have to imagine Jesus telling all these events. I mean, Matthew gives us two chapters in his book 28 chapters in Matthew, and two of them are taken up in just Jesus explaining this on that Tuesday evening. And you have to imagine, I mean, it's been a tumultuous day already. I mean, Jesus has been in constant controversy with the religious leaders who are looking for a way to kill him, and it's got to have, you know, penetrated into the minds of his disciples. Jesus might just be in trouble here. They might be looking to kill him. And then now they've come, you know, on that evening to the, the precipice of the hill overlooking the temple. And Jesus tells about the temple be, going to be destroyed. And he says that from the time that it's destroyed until the end of the age, there's going to be great troubling of the earth. The earth will not be at peace. The world won't progressively become a better place. There are always going to be great cataclysmic events. And in the middle of this cataclysm, God's people, 
even though persecuted, are going to be taking the gospel to the very ends of the earth, and then will come the signs of the end of the age and the troubling of the earth, and suddenly when it seems like no one could survive, when the days are so dark it seems like it couldn't go on, Jesus says, then I will appear in the heavens, and then I will defeat evil, and then I will reign for all times. Now we might say to ourselves, I mean, wow, that's quite a day that the disciples had just gone through. They, their minds were reeling with all the information that they had just received. And, and I think this is so important because, uh, uh, you know, they would have said to themselves, well, if that's all true, I mean, why would Jesus have ridden into Jerusalem just a couple of days earlier on Sunday, and he comes on a donkey that fulfills the messianic hope that the Messiah comes to save Israel from her enemies? and he rides in and all the people are on either side of the lining the street as he's coming and they're you know waving palm branches and they're putting blankets down before him and they're saying blessed is the messiah blessed is the king of the age blessed is the one who comes in the name of the lord i mean back on sunday it seemed like the glory days were just before them and that jesus was just about to mount his throne and smite his enemies and here we are on tuesday evening And it seems like there's a dark, long future in which the disciples of Jesus and the followers of Jesus in the future will have to go through a time of pressing the gospel to every corner of the world while they're suffering in dark times. So, yeah, it's fascinating to me. What would they have thought? Why wouldn't they have said, I mean, you know, we don't understand how this whole thing is turning out, and and they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have known that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to be put to death so that he could die for the sins of the world, so that anyone who might put their hope in Christ would be saved from their sins and reconciled to God and have a place in the eternity to come. Jesus was securing a possibility for the human race. He was not just securing a possibility, he was securing the actuality of a given people to become the people of God. That's what he was doing, and the disciples didn't yet understand. In fact, the agenda of Jesus was so much greater than they ever could have imagined. The week was turning out so different than they would have anticipated. All these things were happening. But Jesus isn't done quite yet. He says, no one knows the day or the hour of my coming. And then he says, it's going to be like the days of Noah. It will be like two men in a field. One is taken away unto judgment and the one who remains in the field is going to be left spared. And then he tells two parables, and he ends with these two parables, and the first parable, you know, these, you know, the disciples would have been overwhelmed by it. The first one is the parable of the faithful servant who doesn't know when his master is coming, but remains faithful, knowing that the day or the hour of the master's return will happen. Then comes a second parable, and it's the parable of ten virgins, and they're waiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. Five are faithful and wait and anticipate, and five are foolish and stop waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus wants to say these things. You want to be faithful. Don't fritter your time away. Use it wisely. And with these parables, Jesus, knowing that he has gotten his disciples' attention, reminds them that he will come as the reigning king, gathering all the nations of humanity before his throne, welcoming some into eternal dwellings and condemning others to eternal punishment. Yes, the day will come when he will separate the sheep from the goats and he will be the Messiah that they waited for. Well, but like when I began this whole series, I began by saying that when this week began, you know, maybe back on Saturday evening, and Jesus had been in the home of a man named Simon the leper on on Saturday night in Bethany, I said that though that day it was as if the conductor had stepped out upon his podium, his hands are in the air, he holds a baton in his hand, and he's about to direct the course of events for the next week, which will change the course of events of the whole world. That's what Jesus is doing now. His disciples are getting a vision by Tuesday night that the agenda of Jesus was so much greater than they ever had imagined. It was so wide sweeping, it would cover the entire earth and they themselves had a part to play. When we move towards the Easter season, it's important for us to remember that. 
uh, Jesus is still conducting the events of history. And that's what we learn from Tuesday night. It's not that the world is random. It's not just that you know, people expected him to come again so shortly after his resurrection. And now it's been 2,000 years and who knows, you know, maybe he'll come, maybe he won't. But rather, Jesus is saying, I'm going to direct the course of human history until it reaches that one moment when I will come back. And when I come back, I will restore all things. That's the promise of Tuesday night. It happened on a day of exhaustion. It happened on a day of controversy. But it happened because Jesus was concerned that his disciples should know there will be controversy until my coming again. Easter reminds us that there's controversy, that there's death, and that there's suffering. But it also reminds us that there is the hope and the anticipation of a glorious resurrection from the dead and the consummation of all things. Hey, thank you for being a part of this program today. Thanks for listening, taking the time. May the Lord bless you as you anticipate the Easter season. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.